Hi, I'm Bill Kinney, and this is my 165th video on financial math for actuarial exam 2. Sorry, it's been over a month since I made my last video. Uh, things have been real busy with exams and with Thanksgiving here in America. Things are going to be pretty busy next week as well. I've got final exams that I've got to give and grade. Um, then Christmas is coming up. I'm hoping I can get in some more videos besides this one as well, but I'm not positive that I'll be able to. I'll do my best. This is a modified version of problem 7.1.9 in Berman's book, the 7th edition on financial math. Uh, you can see it's a starred problem, which means it's extra hard. This is a more challenging problem. It's pretty theoretical, pretty long video here. Um, lots of real detailed calculations that if you really want to get it, you're going to have to pause the video and double check things. Uh, and it's going to be easy to make mistakes, so you're going to want to really work at it to try to avoid those mistakes, to try to fix your mistakes if you do make them. But once again, I think um, especially the main conceptual points that we can get from all the symbolic manipulations will be worthwhile. You can see I'm working in a Mathematica notebook here. Uh, that's going to allow me to make some graphs that will, I think, provide some insight and, and do some algebra as well to simplify some expressions to help me uh, solve the problem. Uh, it's a multi-part problem. We are considering something kind of strange. We're not considering a usual bond. We're considering a bond with continuous coupons that are paid at a constant rate of R per period. You could imagine that to be R dollars per period or R thousand dollars per period or something like that. So this is money coming to us continuously at a constant rate. And then we have a final redemption amount of one in N periods. That's a one-time payment, N periods from time zero. And all this is valued at a continuous yield rate, delta, uh, instead of a discrete yield rate, j. All right, so there are three parts, a, b, and c. And again, I'm modifying this from what's in the book to be, I think, a little bit more clear and perhaps a little bit more interesting. Part a, uh, we're going to be expressing the derivative of l with respect to delta, where l is the present value of the income stream, so that would be the present value of the continuously paid coupons and the redemption amount as a function of delta, the continuous yield rate. We want to take that derivative and express it in terms of continuous annuity symbols, like an A bar, for example, and the factors R, N, and delta. could have called these parameters instead of factors. The, the word factor makes you think it's in, these are involved in products, and that's not necessarily the case. But these are this is how it's stated in the book. So that's the first thing we'll do. Part B. Uh, the modified duration, we've talked about both Macaulay duration and modified duration. The modified in duration in this context is pretty much the same idea as the modified duration in the usual context, which is discrete. Uh, take the derivative of the present value as a function of the yield rate and divide by the current value of the present value and then put a negative sign in front of it, actually making this a positive quantity because this derivative is negative. L is a decreasing function of delta. Uh, the next thing to do, well, based on that definition, is first thing to do actually is to find an expression for the derivative of this thing with respect to n. Okay, so you got these different quantities. You've got an, a delta, an r, and an n. This is the de definition of the modified duration. It will depend on delta, but it will also depend on r and n. And if you change your perspective, you could think of n as being a variable and take the derivative with respect to n. Now, typically, we think of n as being a whole number. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, etc. But evidently, to take this derivative, we're going to change our perspective and think of it as being a continuous variable. Uh, we're going to show, after we take that derivative, that it has the same sign as this expression. Uh, it won't equal that expression, but it will have the same sign. And that's a useful thing to realize, because what it's going to imply is that if the uh, coupon rate, as a continuously paid coupon rate of our amount of money per unit time is greater than or equal to delta, the yield rate, as a continuous yield rate, then the modified duration increases with n. As n goes up, as the time of the final payment goes up, the duration is going to go up, which should make some intuitive sense. Again, duration, whether it's Macaulay or modified, is in a sense a measure of the average time of payment. Uh, with respect to whatever the yield rate is and when the time, when the payments are made. But on the other hand, if the if R is less than delta, if the continuous payment rate is smaller than the yield rate, then the modified duration is increasing for small values of n and then decreasing for larger values of n. There's some n0 or n naught if you prefer, at which the function changes from increasing to decreasing. So you're going to have a maximum 
value at n0. The book mentions this accounts for smaller durations for 60 coupon bonds uh, compared to 30 coupon bonds in a certain table on a certain page of Broberman's book. I'm also going to say that this is similar to something that happens in a video I did 10 videos ago, video 155, uh, that I made in, I think, August of 2018, <clears throat> uh, for a discrete Macaulay version duration of this, which is a more common kind of thing to think about. And then also, as in that video from uh, August, we're going to give a financial interpretation to the results in Part B. Okay, so a lot going on here. Let's start with part A, where we want to take this derivative and express it in terms of continuous annuity symbols. Um, to do that, I should, I think it would be worthwhile to do a bit of a derivation first of the equation to describe how to come up with the equation for L as a function of delta. They don't tell you what the equation is in this problem, so that's really part of the problem is to do that. And so you need to think uh, intuitively in terms of differentials or sometimes they're called infinitesimal quantities. First you should understand that if the coupons are paid at a constant rate of R per period, uh, you know, like in dollars per year, period of times, and here I do say, pretend it's say in dollars per year, then if dt is the tiny amount of time that elapses, R times dt would be the tiny amount of the payment, and this would not be taking present value into account. This would represent an amount of money coming to you over a tiny amount of time. Actually, this would be true even for longer periods of time. Uh, we wouldn't have to think of this equation in terms of differentials, also called infinitesimals. Um, but this will help us derive the formula in terms of an integral. So the tiny amount dA over the tiny interval of time dt. But then if you have the yield rate delta, we need to discount this tiny amount of uh, money back to time zero. The present value dl, the tiny present value of this amount, I'm calling it dl because l is the symbol for the present value of the whole thing, um, is going to be found by multiplying the amount by the discount factor e to the negative delta t in terms of the continuous yield rate delta. And because dA is r dt, you can replace um, dA with that and get this. This would be an expression for dl the tiny present value of a tiny payment um, made over a tiny interval of time dt. <clears throat> Adding, quote-unquote, these things up via integration, if you imagine integration as being a summation of infinitesimals, this is not a rigorous description of integration. It's an intuitive description that most scientists think about, uh, including economists. Gives the present value of the coupon income stream to be the integral the total coupon present value is the sum of the little coupon values, which you can write in terms of t like this. But of course, this must be done over an appropriate inter interval. This is not really a well-defined symbol here. Um, I mean, it's, a, it's an antiderivative, you might say, but we're, we're really after a numerical an answer. So we're really after a definite integral. In this case, the interval is from 0 to t, so we should really write this. Okay? This is just intuition up here to derive that. In addition, we've got the present value of the redemption amount of 1 at time n to be e to the negative n delta times 1, and therefore the total present value is given by this expression. And I hope you have had enough experience to realize the integral of e to the negative delta t dt is the same as a bar sub n delta. That would be a, you could call that a present value of a level annuity stream, and then if you've got the factor of r in there, it's going to be a factor of r there, and you again have the e to the negative delta there. That would be an annuity symbol, annuity, a continuous annuity. Uh, the formula for that is 1 minus e to the negative n delta over delta, so you could write that like this after multiplying by r as well. And you could also write the formula in a couple different ways like this or like this, and any of these different forms could be useful for various ways of thinking about things. Here I have some Mathematica code that will confirm this answer. Uh, Mathematica is giving the output for this uh, present value in this way, which you might, I guess, most say closely matches this one when you pull this fraction apart in two, into two pieces right there. Okay, So that's just a double check of the calculation there. All right, we haven't done part A yet. All we've done is derive the formula for L. Now in part A, we want to differentiate this with respect to delta, so we want to pretend R and N are fixed. 
And there's a few different ways you can think about it here. Uh, I think all these different ways are useful to think about and good to know you can think about it in these different ways because it gives you flexibility in your problem solving. We could, well, first we want to differentiate a, uh, a bar here. Uh, that's not the going to lead give the be the final answer, but it's going to lead us to the final answer, which is down here. Um, that would be useful when we're thinking about the formula this way. So we could differentiate a bar by essentially bringing the derivative symbol into the integral, which is allowed here in this context. Switch around the integral and the derivative so we can differentiate the function on the inside. You know, if we were differentiating with respect to n instead of delta, we'd have to use the fundamental theorem of calculus, but we're differentiating with respect to delta so we can bring that derivative symbol inside the integral. Differentiate what I've got highlighted here with respect to delta, treat the t as a constant. So that's going to bring a factor of negative t out in front, so you see the negative sign there, you see the t there. And now you got to do that integral with respect to t. Now, of course, you could do that. But you have to use integration by parts, by the way. But that is also, this integral is also the same as the value of a, the present value of an increasing uh, continuous annuity. So that's got the symbol i bar a bar and the negative signs there, so don't forget to put it here as well. Uh, you also could think of it this way a bar is the same as this. And so you could use the quotient rule to differentiate that with respect to delta. And so I've got the low function times the derivative of the high minus the high times the derivative of the low, which is 1, with respect to delta times the square of the bottom there. Uh, that could be rewritten like this, and that is also, if you know the formula for i bar, a bar, it's the same as this. Again, okay? Um, some other things you can notice here, uh, just as another double check of things, is that this expression right here simplifies to this expression, which is the same as i bar, a bar. Um, and that all, uh, is also worth noting because it allows you to write the formula for the derivative of a bar with respect to delta in this way as well. Okay, so a um, bunch of different ways of thinking about it. We're not, we're still not quite done. This is just part of getting the answer again. But it, I think all these different calculations, which you should take the time to check, are worthwhile to think about and be flexible in your problem solving. If you want to see the formula for the for i bar a bar, it's right here. That's one form of the formula, which is what you see right here, or right here. Um, and now we finish part a by also differentiating uh, r times a bar, and then also differentiating the e to the negative n delta right here with respect to delta to get an extra factor of negative n in front, which is what you see right here. And this can be written in different ways as well. And you should take the time to check all these things. Uh, what's in blue here is the form that you'll find in the answer in the back of the book and also in the solutions manual as the form uh, that they put the answer in. But all of these different answers are correct. And by the way, what I'm using here when I highlight that is based on what you see here. This thing here equaling that right there. Okay? That's being used here. Um, let's use Mathematica here to make... Um, well, to do, first of all, double check something. We are going to make some graphs later here as well. I am uh, plugging the function for the present value of this uh, income stream from this continuous bond into Mathematica as a function of n, r, and delta. And Mathematica is checking that we get the same thing, and you should think about this when we differentiate that with respect to delta, and when we expand this expression. Uh, and when we expand this expression here, and all these things are the same, you see these diff three different outputs are all the same. And you should think about that, how that's all related to what I, I just talked about up there. Okay? All right, let's move on to part B. So what again was part B? Uh, this is just a reminder of what the modified duration is. We first, first want to take the derivative of that with respect to n, treating the r and delta as constants. We're going to see it has the same sign as this thing, that's going to involve having Mathematica help us with some algebra checking. And then we want to think about what happens uh, to d mod as n increases in two cases if r is greater than or equal to delta and if r is less than delta. So this is even uh, more nasty algebra. Um, so what is the modified duration in here? Uh, we can use what we found in part A. Um, 
And again, the definition of the modified duration as negative 1 over L times the derivative we just found in part A. So, okay, again, come back down here. I guess I have that here already. So this is the derivative we found in part A, one form of it. And this is the negative sign, and this is L right there. Okay, that would be uh, the present value. Let's see, double check that. Yeah, that would be the present value of the payment stream. All right, uh, we could simplify that a little bit. We could distribute the minus sign through the top. And we could also multiply the top and the bottom by delta, canceling these deltas here and here, and bringing extra deltas here and here, uh, as just another way to write the modified duration that you could say is a little bit simpler. So now we want to, again, think of r and delta as fixed and differentiate this with respect to n, show it has the same sign as this. Think about differentiating this with respect to n. We're going to have to use the quotient. Rule n does appear in both the top and the bottom. Uh, and it will be useful to first note this fact right here, which you should look over quickly. And that is a fairly easy calculation in the scheme of things here with differentiating a bar with respect to n. And now we use the quotient rule on this expression. So we have the, the low, the bottom function, times the derivative with respect to n of the, the top function, minus the top function, times the derivative of the bottom, divided by the square of the bottom there. Um, then you can do those derivatives based on this fact here. So this derivative of a n bar here is going to result in an e to the negative n delta right there. Um, you can, when differentiating this with respect to n, you are going to have to use the product rule, which is what I end up doing right here. I'll let you think about that. Then you need to also differentiate this with respect to n, once again using this fact up here. Uh, and you should get this. And the derivative of a bar again would be this right there. And then you again have the square on the bottom. Now since you've got a square on the bottom, this quantity is never negative. That means the sign of the derivative, the sign of the derivative is determined by the top of the fraction, the numerator, this thing up here. Kind of complicated. Let's punt now as far as the algebra goes and let Mathematica expand the top. And we'll use the fact that a bar equals this. Um, we could expand, expand it with an a bar in there like this, here uh, and here. And here's the result if you want to pause the video and write that down. Um, and you could try double checking that on your own. I also could expand it as I say here with this substitution. So right here and here I'm replacing a bar with its formula in terms of e. Capital E by the way is the number e in Mathematica. And if you expand that, you get the same thing. You can compare the, um, actually not, uh, these are the same thing uh, if you go ahead and, let's see, we want to see, what do I want to say here? We want to see if this thing expands to the same thing as this. These are the same thing, it's just hard to tell. Um, it's because, again, you'd have to, to make the comparison, you'd have to replace the A bars here here and here and here with 1 minus e to the negative n delta over delta. Uh, but this would be what it equals if you do that. Um, does this thing expand to the same thing or at least something that clearly has the same sign? Here's what it expands to. And it's a little hard to tell at first, but this, this expression right here does indeed have the same sign as the expression above it. In fact, it's it is that expression above it times e to the negative n delta over delta. Now, it's a little hard to see in looking at these things, but if you're careful, you can do it here. For example, where does the 2r come from? Uh, it comes from multiplying this term by e to, the e to the n delta over delta. Where does the negative 2 e to the negative n delta o uh, times r come from? Uh, let's see, I think it comes from multiplying this one by e to the n delta over delta. Yeah, that's correct. Where does the nr squared come from? Looks like it comes from this one. The minus r squared over delta um, comes from, let's see, multiplying, where's an r squared here? Multiplying, I think, this one. Yeah, this one by e to the n delta over delta. Uh, and you can check these last three. They, they are the, the same thing up to multiplication by this factor here. In other words, we have confirmed with Mathematica that this is in fact true, actually. The, the derivative can be 
uh, written as this expression times the reciprocal of this thing, delta times e to the negative n delta. Okay, so that's another way to write the derivative, and therefore it does have the same sign as this expression right here. Okay, so you'd want to take the time to double check these things if you felt like you had the time and really wanted to confirm that. But we have done that. But the more important thing about that is what does it mean? Okay, we go on to the most important parts of the problem is understanding what this means about the bona fide duration and the financial implications of this. Again, we want to argue that if r is greater than or equal to delta, if the continuously paid coupon rate is greater than or equal to the, uh, the yield rate as a continuous rate, then the modified duration always increases as n increases. But if that continuous coupon payment rate is smaller, then the modified duration increases at first and then decreases after a point. So we're going to see that. Uh, we'll think about that here. We are going to continue using Mathematica to check some things, including making some graphs that I think you'll find to be pretty interesting, pretty neat. And that would be, at least with one of them, very difficult to do without Mathematica. So let's do these case, cases now. If we're in the case where r is greater than or equal to delta, that means r minus delta is greater than or equal to zero. Notice in this expression right here, which is the thing we want to focus on for the sign, that you've got a factor of r minus delta there. So in this case, r minus delta is non-negative. We also know that this difference is non-negative as well. Um, and that factor appears right here. You can think about this financially or derive that in terms of integrals. Uh, the present value of a continuous payment stream of where your, the rate is coming in at one, one dollar per year, say, is going to be less than the number of years of the total amount paid because you're taking present values there. So again, I guess I have this expression here, down here as well, and I, I put the negative, the delta e to the negative delta and delta is there as well. So in this case, this is non-negative, this is non-negative, this is certainly positive right there, this is positive, and this is positive, and r is positive. So you definitely have a bunch of non-negative things mixed with positive things, strictly positive things. You can say this whole thing is positive. Okay, we are assuming the typical case here where delta is positive. Okay, that's going to be true when this is true. So this derivative is positive. Uh, no matter what n is, okay, in this case. So the modified duration increases with n. It's an increasing function of n. On the other hand, in the other case, it's a bit more complicated. r minus delta is, r is less than delta, so r minus delta is negative. So in this expression, this thing is negative. This thing is still positive. These other things are still positive, or at least this one's non-negative. And that's going to mean the product here is going to be negative. Um, for all n. Okay, that's that's only part of what we're saying here. Actually, it's what I'm looking at in this expression right here. I was a little too hurried. There is just this part right there, not including the delta right there. So this thing is negative, but the delta there is still positive, meaning when n is small, it turns out, this is the derivative is still going to be positive at first. So we can note that when n is 0, this expression actually equals 0. So it turns out that this part of the derivative up here times this, the numerator, when n is 0 will actually equal delta squared. You'll have a delta here times a delta there and a 1 there when n is 0. And this thing times this thing is 0. You're going to get a delta squared, which is positive, when n is 0. You get a positive derivative at first. The function increases at first, and it's a continuous function, and it's a continuous derivative. So it increases for some time interval, but ultimately, this thing goes to minus infinity, and therefore, ultimately, this thing has to be negative for sufficiently large n, right? Because delta is just some positive number, tiny positive number, in fact. This thing will eventually become negative, making the derivative eventually negative. And so this means, to summarize, that we've essentially verified, we've argued why, there's some positive number n, 0, where the derivative is positive when little n is less than little n, 0, and negative afterwards. In other words, d mod increases at first and then decreases, and it's got a maximum value at n, 0. It's also worth noting, and we're going to see this in a graph, that no matter what the relationship between r and delta, the modified duration approaches 1 over delta as n goes to infinity. The, the Macaulay duration approached something different, but the modified duration approached 
It approaches 1 over delta as n goes to infinity. L'Hopital's rule can be used to confirm this more fully. And so not only, not only did the graph of the modified duration as a function of n increase, then decrease, but after it starts decreasing, it's got a horizontal asymptote. Here's just a simplification of the, derivative of the um, modified duration in terms of n delta and r. Here we have some graphs, interesting, an interesting graph. And so this is a Mathematica animation here that I can make you with this manipulate function. And we see the graph, the modified duration is a function of n. We are in a situation where r is greater than delta here, so you see the functions increasing all the time. It is approaching a horizontal asymptote at 1 over delta. Uh, 1 over 0 0.6, 0 0.06 is 16 and 2 thirds. That is where this blue dashed line is. That's the horizontal asymptote. And so we continue to see this as long as r is bigger than delta here. We see it increasing toward the horizontal asymptote. However, once again, if r becomes less than delta, it's a little hard to see here at first, but the function actually has a maximum in here. If it's more extreme, you can see the maximum more clearly. So here, r is much less than delta. You see it increases up to a maximum, then decreases down toward that horizontal asymptote that still exists no matter what r and delta are. Um, something pretty interesting here, though, that I didn't realize at first, Say I pick delta to be essentially 0.1 here. Watch what happens as r increases. So I'm going to take r to be a real, real, real small 0 0.001 here. Watch what happens to the location of where this maximum is. When r is 0 0.001, it's close to 40. If I let r increase a little bit, the maximum point moves to the left and downwards. However, once r increases a little further, it's it's a little hard to tell because it's becoming more flat, but that maximum point actually starts moving to the right, maybe right about now. It's starting to move to the right and downwards, so it, it travels along a curve going down into the left before coming back to the right. That's where the maximum point is. That's kind of interesting, I think, as well. Um, I was interested in seeing if we could solve for where that maximum point is, solve for the where the derivative equals zero, so I'm essentially setting the numerator of the derivative equal to zero here and solving for n in terms of r and delta. And well, it's not a simple function <laughs> trying to solve for n in terms of delta and r because you've got the e to the negative n delta in there as well as n's here and here and another e to the negative n delta right there. But Mathematica actually can solve it in terms of something called the product log function. So this is kind of a crazy looking expression. The product log, log function is an honest to goodness function and I'll show you what its graph looks like here in a second. But here's the more interesting thing. You, if you graph this thing as a function of r for a fixed delta say, and I took delta to be 0.1 here just like it is in this graph here. Um, so I'm graphing this now as a function of r for fixed delta. You see n0 where the maximum occurs, same notation as before. It's up near, actually, I guess, 55 when r is really, really tiny. Um, I guess I used an even smaller value of r there, 0.0001. If I get rid of one of those zeros, maybe it goes down to 40. Yeah, OK, there's more like the animation. It decreases, then it increases. Okay, it doesn't decrease down to zero, it decreases to a low value, like around 20 something here, uh, before it increases. That's illustrating the fact that in this graph, this maximum point moves to the left first. The n value where the maximum occurs moves to the left first, gets down close to 25 something or so, and then it starts moving to the right. Okay, so some, another something unexpected that happens that's interesting to think about. By the way, the product log function, uh, happens to be this blue graph. Um, it's in the inverse function of x times e to the x only over the interval where uh, x times e to the x is increasing from negative 1 to infinity here. Um, you can see it's the inverse function of that piece if you reflect it across the line y equals x. The blue graph is the reflection of this red graph. Um, that derivative of that red graph happens to be this which is clearly minimized when x is negative 1 and the value there is negative e to the negative 1, which is about negative 0.368. That's the second coordinate of this point. 
which is the first coordinate to this point, which is the left endpoint of the domain for this product log function. All right, finally, we're on to financial interpretations. Oh, financially speaking, um, this is important. When the coupon rate is smaller than the yield rate, so that's when um, R is smaller than delta, that's the case where you have a maximum. There's some value that maximizes the duration, and that doesn't happen if R is bigger than delta. So we're mostly thinking about this case where R is less than delta here. This is the value of M that would put you at maximum duration risk. Okay, now duration risk could be good or it could be bad. It sounds bad, but it, it could be good. When the duration is high, when it's maximized in this case, duration risk is bad for you when the yield rates are going up and prices are going down. Because what that's going to mean is, um, well, the duration being high means your, your price is going to be more sensitive to changes in yield rates. And when the yield rate goes up, your price goes down, you can't resell your bond for as high as you might like. And it's, again, gonna, it's going to go down faster for an increase in the yield rate when the duration is high. Um, because the price of your bond will fall more rapidly than one with a lower duration. On the other hand, uh, let's see. Actually, i got to retype the same thing here. On the other hand, when the duration is high, duration risk is good for you when the yield rates are going down and prices are going up because then you can re resell the bond for something higher. And again, when the duration is high in that case, a small increase in or a small uh, decrease in the yield rate is going to cause your price to increase more rapidly than a bond with a lower duration. Again, I'll remind you of video 155. I talk about pretty much these same topics, but in a more typical context with a discrete Macaulay duration version of all this. Thanks again for having the patience and the tenacity to stick through this video. I hope you got a lot out of it.